Hello and welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we're doing on a lovely Sunday evening in April. It's about to get serious. Joining us from New York City, where he attended the Brooklyn Nets season finale at the Philadelphia 76ers in one of the not-so-consequential games on Sunday, Tim Bontemps. It turned out I should have gone nice little 40-minute stroll walking down the street to Madison Square Garden where there was the game of the day, and I was watching it instead in the Sixers locker room this afternoon, the entire Sixers team. Went overtime with the Knicks winning and getting the number two seed in the Eastern Conference, which I believe they haven't had in 12 years. Playing to win the game. What a concept. Play to win the game. He's given a little preview. Joining us from Los Angeles where he attended the Houston Rockets phase two finale where they beat the, um, you know, shutting it down LA Clippers on Sunday. Um, The Rockets finished the season at 41 and 41, but Ohm, I know we're going to be talking about the Clippers with you. Ohm Youngmasuk. I can report that Kawhi Leonard was in the building and he walked past me on the way out. And uh, hopefully he will be ready for game one. Hopefully is one of those tricky words that we've heard with Kawhi over the years. We will discuss that uh, later. So I think the big overall news coming out of the final day of the season was that the Oklahoma City Thunder secured the number one seed in the Western Conference. They ended up tied with the Nuggets for the best record. They win the tiebreaker. The Nuggets get the two seed. Um, 57 wins for the Thunder, even where they were 10 days ago when Shea Gildas Alexander is missing all those games and Jalen Williams to get the number one seed, just amazing. We're talking about them maybe a lot over the next couple of months. Um, In the Eastern Conference, Boston Celtics ended the season with 64 wins. No interest or drama there. But after that, boy, was it a traumatic day. Seeds two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the Eastern Conference were all bandying around. A lot of scoreboard watching. The games were all going on at the same time. They all didn't start at the same time, but they all were going on at the same time. No, they all started at the same time. They didn't end at the same time. Right. Well, right. That's right. They did all start at the same time. Well, the that's right. One team game finished first. And I think that's where we're going to start. And one of the more interesting things of the day, and there was a lot of stuff that was happening, a lot of strat- strategy that was going on. Some played out well, some didn't. Some teams probably pretty happy the way things went. A lot of still stuff up in the air as we have to see how the play in plays out. All of that will be discussed. But there was an interesting decision today in Cleveland where the Cavs were playing the Hornets and the Cavs were locked in to finish no worse than fourth. They were going to have home court in the first round, no matter what their opponent wasn't clear, but they could finish two, three or four. And they announced before the game that uh, Donovan Mitchell with his knee issue and Darius Garland with a back issue and Karis LeVert who's been battling a knee issue. were all sitting Um but they were playing the Hornets, who, quite frankly, at this point are a G League team. No offense. Um, they've got a lame duck coach on the sideline. Steve Clifford has already been essentially fired as the, as the head coach. They're already interviewing for his replacement. And they, they were, sat basically their entire team today because a loss for them ensured they would finish third by themselves in the lottery standings, as opposed to being tied with Portland and San Antonio, who eventually won later. But they So they had a huge incentive to lose the game. So... Where we're going to start this is at the start of the fourth quarter, where I believe the Cavs were up by six points, um, six or eight points. And at that moment in time, their game was going faster than all the other games. They hit the fourth quarter first. And at the time, the Milwaukee Bucks, who came in the day as a two seed, without Giannis in Orlando, did Dame play in that game? Everybody played in that game, and they just got their butts kicked by the Magic. So they were down 20 at that point. Also at that point, the Chicago Bulls were ahead of the Knicks. It was a close game. It was um, less than 10 points. That game ended up going to overtime. But at that moment, the Cavaliers were looking straight in the face of the two seed. Um, At the start of the fourth quarter, J.B. Bickerstaff basically benched his second and third string and went to his fourth string. And um, the lineup they played, and before Bontemps is ready to spit fire about this, he said, I will not delay it anymore. Um, but before the game, say the Cavs, they decided their quote unquote starters 
for this game, which were really their second string most of, plus Evan Mobley and Max Truce. Those two guys, starting quality players, were playing. The Cavs say that they decided before the game that they were going to not play those guys in the fourth quarter, no matter what happened. Um, and then Craig Porter, who was their starting point guard in this game because uh, Gar- Garland and, and Donovan Mitchell were out, he hurt his leg in the first half and did not return. Okay. Tim Bontemps, then what happened? The Cavs had one of the biggest disgraces I've ever seen in my 12 years or so covering the NBA. And it's one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen in a history of the league, what they did in the fourth quarter of this game. They closed the game. They take out Max Drews for six minutes and 39 seconds to go. They're up by six. They close with a closing lineup, essentially with four centers and Imani Bates, who is a shooting guard, small forward, so catch and shoot three point guy. Um, he's a G League player is, who also is almost like seven feet tall. That's right. He, a, he 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 he's played. He's maybe played a dozen or so games. For yeah, the he's, a, he's, he's a, a he's a he's a two way player for them. It was a second round pick last year. Uh, played Evan Mobley's brother Isaiah. Played Tristan Thompson. Played Damian Jones. Played Pete, Pete Nance scored his first. Played points. Larry Nance's Congrats. younger brother Pete Nance. Congrats that's their. Pete. That's the lineup that Revere High the School just outside. So, so Amani Bates was the point guard. Yeah, playing a team, a, a horrible team that's trying to lose, that's sitting their 10 best players basically in the game to make sure they lose. Cavs got outscored on the home court 18 to two to end the game over the final six and a half minutes of the game. This was a reprehensible thing that the Cavs did. What the Cavs did was scream to the world. They have absolutely no faith in their team that they can't beat Philly. They can't beat Miami. So let's make sure we finish fourth and we get Orlando. So maybe we can win a series and then we're going to get pounded by Boston because clearly we have no faith in beating Philly or Miami. So God, God help us against Boston because what are we going to do against them? I mean, every year we get to the final day or two of the regular season and I got to hear all these people say, oh, this team should try to tank to get this matchup or this team should try to tank to do this, try to avoid this team in the first round. All of this drives me absolutely insane. And it was made worse when after the Cavs had this reprehensible showing The Knicks are playing this game against the Bulls, an incredible game. We're all in the locker room in Philly watching this game. You've got, I mean, I'm a little surprised, frankly, that the Bulls played it the way they did, and they played all their guys 40 minutes in a meaningless game. But DeMar DeRozan played 44. Listen, Alex Cruz played over 40. Tibbs was over there wiping tears from his eyes. Listen, it, it it was a hell of a game, and there's people saying, oh, the Knicks should tank right now and get the three seed to play Indiana. like. What are we doing here? The whole point of this, in theory, if you're a top four team in your conference, you should be going to the playoffs saying, hey, we got a chance to win two rounds, get to the conference finals, win, get to the NBA finals, win a title. That's what you should be thinking about the goal is. All I've heard about from the Cavs for the past year and a half is, oh, we got this great core. We're building this thing. It's going to be great. We got all this young talent. We're going in this awesome direction. They had the two seed potentially sitting on a platter for them. And what they did was scream to all their fans at home and everybody watching, man, Miami, which has been a shell of itself all year, not even sure they're going to make it out of the play-in. We'll see who wins this game on Wednesday. Philadelphia, maybe Joel Embiid's going to be out there playing like an MVP, or maybe his knee is going to be an issue again. We already saw him have an issue on Friday. He didn't play Sunday. Everybody I talked to today across the board universally said it was a precaution. I think it's a fair thing to assume given the fact that they ended up beating the Nets, who also were sitting basically their whole team by 25 points. So they sit him out, but who knows? Maybe something happens with Joel. It's not like you're playing the 2017 Warriors in the first round of the playoffs. And beyond that, by sitting your guys in this game and tanking this game, which they flat out did, they can claim whatever they want. They quite obviously looked at the scoreboard at the start of the fourth quarter and said, oh man, We don't want to play Philly. We're going to make sure that we don't. So now they're on the same side of the bracket as the one team in the East. Everybody's sure is the clear favorite to win. And on top of that, they've shouted from the rooftops that their team isn't good enough. I remember three years ago, everybody said the Milwaukee Bucks made a grave mistake lining themselves up with the the Miami Heat in the first round. Oh, how could the Bucks do this? They lost to the Heat in the bubble. Now they play them again. They're going to lose in the first round. What's going to happen? The Bucs went out and absolutely curb stomped the Heat. One in four games. 
set the complete tone for them going through the playoffs and winning a championship. Happened two years ago, ago. Happened two years ago with Boston. People thought they should avoid the the Nets and Durant and Kyrie. Yep. They and had they, a similar situation. And they, they did. Played. And they played the game. They get the two seven. They sweep the Nets and destroy them. Ten years ago, They're I'm the covering the game. Nets. The year after, Joaquin Noah ripped their hearts out in Game Seven in Brooklyn. Caused them, as Ohm knows, Ohm was there. Caused them to trade for Pierce and Garnett. Caused the whole thing to ch- Jason Kidd coming in, all that stuff. Final day of the season, they're playing here in Brooklyn. They have a chance to win a game and get Chicago again, get on the opposite side of bracket of Miami, or tank the game, go to six, play Toronto in the first round, and get Miami in the second round. I talked to all their people before the game. You can ask Bobby Marks. I talked about it earlier today. I said, What are you guys doing? Why are you avoiding Chicago? Joe Kim Noah is playing on one leg. This team stinks. You guys will beat them easily. And then he would have played Indiana in the second round when Roy Hibbert basically had completely collapsed from a confidence standpoint. They would have won that series. They'd have been sitting in the conference finals against the Heat with Dwayne Wade with a bum knee. Instead, they play the Heat in the second round after going seven games to Toronto. They lose a competitive five-game series to Miami, and they go home in the second round. But they won a first-round series. Congratulations. I'm glad you did that. It just, it drives me absolutely insane that we spend all this time, and now there's today, there's all this discussion. Oh. We have to reward winning. It's it's too bad that the Knicks are playing the Sixers potentially in the first round. Or you could just say the Knicks are not afraid because they've spent the last four months telling everybody with their play on the court, they believe they're a championship level team. And they acted like a championship level team today. And the Cavaliers acted like a scared team that is just hoping it can win a first round series. And if now they're going into a series with Orlando, a big physical team that could beat them up inside, just like the Knicks did last year. So I'm sorry for talking so long, but this whole thing has driven me insane. And yet I would say, I would say, despite all that, Bontemps, if the Cavs do win this first round series against Orlando, they will consider it. And I think many people will consider it a successful season, as opposed to if they had lost in the first round as the number two seed to the number seven seed in a best of seven series. Like, look, this isn't NFL football. You don't play one game and you might be able to win that. Like. Like I saw our good friend Mike Vaccaro, the New York Post, uh, mentioned the other day that the Knicks game against the Celtics a couple of nights ago reminded him of when the New York Giants went full on out with nothing left to play for against the New England Patriots in that last regular season game. And it paid dividends in that same playoffs when they faced the Patriots in the Super Bowl. They won. But that's an NFL where you have one game to play and anything can happen. In a best of seven series, the Cavs probably might not get past a Joel Embiid Sixers or Joel Embiid. Well, they is didn't healthy. get. I mean, I know the the regular season. <laughs> talking about the regular season for the next week before these series start is going to be a fool's errand. People are going to get embarrassed. In the regular season, Philly did clean the Cavs' clock even without Embiid. I, I'm just I'm just stating that. So, and and by the way, I'm going to quote JV Bickerstaff. We had our plan in place of what we were going to do with the guys and Craig Porter not being out there made it a little difficult in the fourth quarter, but we wanted to stick to our plan. We were aware of some of the stuff that was going on, but once we sat our guys at the end of the third quarter and they had the mindset, they weren't going to go back in. I didn't want to take any risks of putting them back in the game when they had already cooled down. We had Max Juice out there for half of the fourth quarter. So that's a lot. Hey, Max, Max mean, Juice got a triple a dub. He got a triple dub. He he the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing's <laughs> a lie. And look, oh, to me, If the Cavaliers win this series against Orlando, like, yay, golf clap. They win this series against Orlando. To me, what they did was signal how they really feel about their team, which is their team isn't all that good. And what they should have done was play this out. And by the way, if they had played it out, they'd have got Indiana, which is a way better matchup for them. I would have picked Cleveland to win. And we'd be talking right now about the Cavs fighting through their adversity over the last few weeks, getting Donovan Mitchell healthy, winning 50 games and getting themselves the three seed in the East with a winnable series in the first round and being on the opposite side of the bracket from Boston. And instead, we're talking about them intentionally blowing this game to get Orlando, who they may not even beat. Maybe they win. Orlando just dominated the Bucs today. I know Giannis didn't play. They made Damian Lillard look like he was 45. So 
Maybe Orlando just physically overwhelms them in the series and wins. Then what are we going to be saying? And, and that's very that's very possible. But I still would rather take on the Orlando Magic if I'm the Cleveland Cavaliers in the first round. I then just think potentially just, Miami or Philadelphia. I just think that all that says to me is it's it's a losing mentality. It's just you're a losing organization if that's your mentality. Oh hey, we can maybe win a first round series now. Like this is a team that had designs on being the two seed. We were taught they were favored to be the two seed in our projections for months and well, then have collapsed down the stretch. The what I'd say about the Cavs is they haven't defended for the last eight weeks. They have had a couple of flourishes in this last week where they've had some okay defense. But they don't defend and they don't rebound. They've been terrible at rebounding since the uh, All Star break. If they don't defend and rebound. It doesn't matter who they're playing. Right. But they have put themselves in a position of if they lose to the Magic and. Here I go again. They split the regular season series 2-2, each one on each other's court. I, it doesn't really matter. The Magic can play pretty big. The Cavs sometimes struggle with that. Um, anyway, uh, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley need to have good good series, and Donovan Mitchell has to be closer to the player he was over the last two games, not the player he was um, while he was dealing with that the, the worst part of that knee injury. Uh, Montes, okay. were, you this, were you this fired up about the Mavs last year tanking? I know that it's not yes. a playoff series. Yes. Were you this fired up? Are, I mean, what listen, are you more angry about? Are you angry about angry about the Cavs or what the Mavs did at the end of the last I mean, look, which, by what, the way, paid off for the Mavs. Listen, what the Mavs did was reprehensible, but you could it, there's at least a way for you to explain a logic of, well, hey, we're going to be like, I, I thought it was insane what they did. Now, they got lucky. They kept their pick. They got Derek Lively. Like, that's that's all well and good, right? We're also talking about a team that's going to be 10th or 11th in the standings. This is a team intentionally passing up the chance to finish second in the Eastern Conference standings to get a better matchup in the first round because they were terrified of the possibility of playing the Sixers. Let me ask you this. It, really, the big picture for the Cavs is to keep Donovan Mitchell happy, right? What keeps Donovan Mitchell happier? A first round exit? Or if you won one series for first round, and I'm not saying they're going to, that Donovan Mitchell is going to be there forever, but would it be, would it keep him happier if they actually won a series? Donovan Mitchell on Friday talked about the fact that the baseline expectation for a team should be to get home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. And today, what the Cavs did was scream to the world, Donovan Mitchell, you're not good enough to beat hardly anybody in the Eastern Conference. So, yeah, to me, I don't think that's sending a very good signal to Donovan Mitchell. And by the way, Max Struess, who played in Miami the last several years, a team that would not do this, I think it's safe to say, he got asked after the game about this, and quote. he said, I mean, I could pull up the exact quote. If you have it there, you want to read it? I wanted to win. I don't really know what else to say. I'm kind of mad we didn't. I mean, it, it's embarrassing. If you're a player on the Cavs, you have to be embarrassed by what happened there. And again, like to me, yes, you're right, Ohm. In a vacuum, they got a weaker first round opponent. Okay. But also, if you're doing it at the sacrifice of showing everybody you don't have faith in your team, then like what are we doing here? It just, it just, it's it's just the all it's an awful mentality to have, all right. in my opinion. All right. And we've well, talked about this enough. Okay. So as it all uh, fell down. Uh, Milwaukee, after holding on with a very tenuous grip to the two seed for weeks, end up as a three seed with the loss in Orlando. They now will play the Indiana Pacers. They're, again, regular season nemesis. They lost to them four times. Couldn't keep up with them. And then, but most importantly, where is Giannis's calf going to be by next week? Um the uh, the the NBA did announce that that series is not going to start until Sunday, so at least Giannis will get an extra day. He'll have um, just a little under two weeks from the uh, injury um, to recover from it. To me, that's the most important thing. But Bon Temps, not the greatest draw for the Bucks. They have home court advantage, but they get a team that definitely. I don't know if it'll matter, but I know the Pacers will come in with confidence into that series. Yeah, they should. And look, to me, the key, as much as Giannis's health is, is is Tyrese Halliburton able to use this week to get back to being the player that he was before his injury? Because I believe 
all five of those games definitely came when Adrian Griffin was the coach. And I'm nearly certain all five of those games came before Tyrese Halliburton hurt his hamstring against the Celtics in early January. And he has not been anywhere near the same player over the past couple of months. But look, the Pacers put up 157 points on Sunday against Atlanta. Now, Atlanta was not really trying. They had nothing to play for. But they're, they're really, even though they got Trey Young back, they're pretty banged up. But we have seen all year, we have talked all year about the fact that the Bucs are really not able to guard anybody, even though they've shown some sides of life later on. They, they are not, by any stretch, an elite defensive team. The Pacers are an incredible offensive team. And the Bucs in the playoffs, in theory, are really going to have to try to outscore people to win. Well, this is not a great matchup for them in terms of having to try to outscore the Pacers. And on top of that, again, I'll go back to what we talked about earlier. I was watching a lot of this game Sunday because the game I was at was not very interesting. And so I was following these other games to see what was going to happen. And the Bucs played everybody but Giannis. They were trying to win this game in Orlando. It's not like they said, oh, we're just going to sit everybody and if we lose, we lose. And Damian Lillard had a brutal game. Levy went, I want to say, two for 14. Two of 14. Yep. I mean, two he couldn't get anywhere. Now, Jalen Suggs and Orlando's defense is as good as anybody's in the league. We just talked about how big and physical they are across the board. But still, you got Dame out there in this game without Giannis. This is the kind of game we go, hey, Dame, we're going for the two seed. Go get it. Like, get us the two seed. And he couldn't do it. Chris Middleton had moments where he looked really good. But Brooke Lopez didn't do a lot. Patrick Beverly gave him nothing. Like, they did not look very impressive. And again, Indiana plays into all their weaknesses. And while I think Milwaukee will win this series, not a great matchup. And I'm very curious to see how it plays out, especially if we get to game one and Tyrese is looking bouncy like he was a couple of months ago. Wendy. First team to defend wins the game ball in this series. That's yeah. that's what might have been. Listen, yep. I kind of like, look, I hope Giannis comes back. I like, I know we don't want to talk about the regular season. Like, I like the animosity we saw between these two teams. Oh, I yes. hope it kind of is there for that playoff series. And I think it will be because you have a very young team in the Pacers. They're, they're getting their feet wet in the playoffs. They're learning Tyrese Halliburton. I think they're going to use that to their advantage to try and inspire them. Um, I think Giannis, look, I hope Giannis is healthy because I think he's going to use any type of chip on his shoulder that he can. I, I hope there's more animosity. Look, I think the, these two teams don't defend at all. I am with you at Bontemps. I think there's a lot of times this season where I thought, okay, Dane will take over here if Giannis isn't playing. Dane would do this, Dane would do that. We haven't really seen that. And now it's his time of the year. The playoffs are his time of the year. So I really want to see him step up. And I don't know if we're going to get that, Dame. And then the other thing, too, is there's a lot of pressure on Doc Rivers in this series. I know he might have the built-in excuse if Giannis doesn't come to play, but I still feel there's going to be pressure on Doc this series. There's pressure on the Bucks. The Bucks yeah. made this Damian Lillard trade, which we've talked about since September, to win a title. They look like a team that could lose in the first round. And we've said the whole time, just like all these other big moves we talked about, what Phoenix did, what some of these other teams did, those are moves designed to win in the playoffs. Well, we've got to the playoffs. It's time to win. And especially with Giannis banged up, because he's probably, let's assume he's probably not going to be 100%, even if he comes back in the first round, which knowing Giannis' history, as we all do, I think it's, I think we all expect him to play if he possibly can. Um, it's time for Damian Lillard to look like Damian Lillard. And today was not a great example of him looking like Damian Lillard. And I think it's cause for concern going into a series against a guy who, can outplay him if he's right in Halliburton. Giannis averaged 42 in the games against the Pacers. I know regular season. I know. But 42 and 42. 13. And they, and they went one and four. I know, but you know, obviously the Pacers don't have a good matchup for him, which is, you know, so, and Halliburton, again, averaged, Halliburton averaged 27 and 11. Yes. And season, the other so. thing is that those, the, the Pacers didn't have Siakam in those games either, who True. obviously he's not a great matchup for Giannis, but he's at least, a better matchup than Obi Toppin, who I believe was the starting power forward in the prior five. That's games. true. Okay. So um, there's going to be a lot of attention paid to Wednesday night when the heat play the 76ers, the 76ers did what they could to overcome their record. When the uh, Embiid injury came down, they went on a great run to end the season, but they just came up a game short. The Pacers 
win on Sunday to, to clinch the sixth seed. So now you have in Philadelphia on Wednesday night. I assume you're going to be there, Bon Toms. I didn't ask you. I will be there, barring uh, something happening. The Miami Heat, <clears throat> who won, <clears throat> who actually lost the seven eight play in game last year, and then won in the second play in game to get the eight seed before going to the finals. We'll try to pull out another play and win. Um, they have struggled to get their whole team together. Uh, they look like they had it all together recently. Um, I assume that they will have most of their guys being able to go. I know uh, Jimmy Butler has been in and out with illness recently and um, Duncan Robinson battling a back issue, but Tyler Hero is back. Terry and we'll see. did not play. Not sure about his availability for yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, uh, he's got a neck injury, so I, I, don't know, I would be stunned if he didn't play, but we'll see. It's a couple of days from now. They actually get an extra day because I think you mentioned on the last podcast that Philly, Philly uh, Flyers have a, you're using the center on Tuesday night. Yes. So normally this game, this seven, eight game, uh, as in the West would be on Tuesday, they get an extra day. So Embiid and everybody else can recover. Embiid left the floor in that game on Friday night after I, it, he, he, he was a drive to the basket and he kind of, in my view, made like a, an odd step with his left foot, with his look, with his left leg left the floor, came back and played. Um, but we don't know. We don't know where he's going to be, Bon Temps, and that will be a huge thing. Obviously, the Knicks will be watching very closely what Embiid's able to bring on uh, on Wednesday because they're going to – by the way, that series is going to start Saturday. Um, they're going to pay for that little uh, – on the back end, uh, that series is going to start Saturday. Um, I think – yeah, the whoever yes. wins that game starts yes. Saturday. He has to go to yes. New York on Saturday. So – uh, to me, one of the, you know, I know there's going to be a lot of focus on the West play in, and we'll get to that in a second. But to me, how Joel and B looks Wednesday night is one of the biggest things in the whole Eastern Conference uh, playoffs. Yeah. And, and look, he came back and played really well in the second half of that game on uh, Friday. Um, Jonathan Isaac, we talked about uh, Orlando. Jonathan Isaac did a, as good a job guarding Joel as I've seen in the last couple of years anybody do. Um, is pretty impressive. He obviously started today in their win. Over Milwaukee, I'd be curious to see what happens there. Wendell Carter Jr. has been dealing with back spasms. But, um, yeah, Joel didn't play today. Everybody I talked to said it was a precautionary thing, and I think it makes sense. Like I think I said earlier, if you look at the way this game went, they won by 25 anyway. The Nets basically sat their entire rotation outside of a couple of guys. So Philly had everybody else play. Joel sits. He now gets five days off before this game Wednesday because, look, this game Wednesday is their season. Same for Miami in theory, right? If you win this game, you got on the opposite side of the bracket of Boston. Nobody in the East is afraid of anybody but Boston, except for Cleveland, who's afraid of everybody. And you <laughs> now give yourself a situation where one more you can get maybe get a couple rounds. This might be Joel Embiid's best chance yet to get to the conference finals, which I know is not getting all the way to the finals, but would obviously be a significant thing for him. But they've got to go through Miami. They've got to go through Jimmy Butler for all the doubts about the Heat. Until they don't get it done in the playoffs, there's always going to be this lingering thing for everybody. And, and they're, are they going to be able to do it again? And in a one-off situation, that fact that that game is in Philly, I don't, I don't think it matters to the Heat. I, I think I, other teams. No, would, would I think we are sleeping on Miami like people do so many times. I, I want to believe you, Ohm. I want to believe you, but they, they really, the, the their, their best players. They really never got them all playing well together. I get but it. I get it. One off, I agree. In a one off, Bam is a gamer. Jimmy, playoff Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, well, and Hero here's the and other thing. can get hot. I mean, yeah. The Heat had three games in the last 10 days of the season against the real games. They had a game in Miami against Philly, a game in, in Indianapolis against Indy, and a game in Miami against Dallas. They win any one of those games, they're the five seed. They lost them all. And they just, they haven't looked like the same kind of team. And I think most importantly, Jimmy Butler has not looked like the same kind of player. Now, again, nobody is going to say the Heat don't have it because we just saw it last year. We've seen it three of the last four years. But it's also worth remembering the Heat have been the lower seed in three of the last four years. And if they get in the playoffs, they're going to be now for a fourth time in five years. So, yes, they've turned it up. They've got the best coach in the league, probably, in Eric Spolstra. They've got a veteran team. They've got Jimmy, who's a proven playoff player. But 
He's now in his mid thirties. He has not looked like the same guy this year, though he's still very good. And let's see if they could turn it up again. But it's also worth pointing out that they were about two and a half minutes away from not even getting out of the eight nine game last year. So that's Absolutely. how that's Absolutely. how much of a, a knife's edge they were on. And you know, we'll see what happens on Wednesday or if they're in a position where they're potentially in a rematch with Chicago in that 8-9 game in Miami again to just get back into the playoffs for another time. All right, Ohm, you pay a lot of attention to the Denver Nuggets. I have a suspicion that you're going to be spending quite a lot of time in Denver <laughs> over the next um, many weeks. On Friday night, the Nuggets were in great shape. They got a great victory a couple of days earlier in Minnesota. Um, Right before Carl Towns came back, they secured the uh, the tie-breaking and everything, and they were in the number one seed. They had to beat the Spurs on um, Friday in San Antonio. Victor did play. And then they got to go play the Grizzlies, who, you know, I think in a must-win game, you liked the Nuggets, and the Nuggets ended up winning that game easily. But they had the Spurs and the Grizzlies. Those were the two games. They had the number one seed. Things looked good. They're up 23 in the second half. We're up 17 early in the fourth quarter. And look, I'm not, you know, the Nuggets very easily could win the title, but in a very consequential thing, not only for where the Nuggets went, but for where everybody else lined up, when Benyama goes crazy, De- Devontae Graham, who I forgot was in the league, has a, has a game winner at the very end. And the Spurs win. Victor wants to throw the ball in the in the crowd, but uh, doesn't want to get fined twenty five grand again, so doesn't. Instead, he spikes it on the ground, and oh my God, the number one seed falls into the Oklahoma City Thunder's lap. That was as shocking of a result, and of everything that's happened in the NBA in the last three four weeks, where we've had all these things change, and the BPI odds changing like crazy every day, and the seeds changing every day. That result had a huge effect on the Western Conference. Yeah, I mean, look, they cost themselves home court advantage. And you remember how good they were last year. They only lost once at home on the way to the championship. They were excellent at home, almost unbeatable. They didn't lose that game until they lost in the, fi- in the finals against Miami. So they kind of made their, their road a little bit tougher because now they're the second seed. They could draw the Lakers in the first round. They could well, draw the Pelicans in the first round. Um, yes, we'll talk about that in a second. The Lakers have lost nine in a row to them. I don't know if they're losing yes. sleep over that. but um, No, I don't think so either. In fact, I think they would probably, they won't admit this, but I think they would probably relish a chance to eliminate the Lakers in the <laughs> you, first round. Certainly think, Michael Malone. You, Michael Malone say, would probably say that. I, I would say, say, you know, look, I... It's strange. I don't think this really necessarily applies to pro basketball that often because it's not quite the same as in college. But I often have this thing about Michigan State, and I'll tell people this, that people are always like, oh, Michigan State does the same thing. They, they're they ranked very high at the beginning of the season, and then they don't play well in the Big Ten Conference. And they're always like, what's wrong with Michigan State? And I tend to like it when they struggle a little bit right before the tournament because that means Izzo has their ear. And I kind of felt the same way, I don't know why, about Michael Malone and the Nuggets when they lost to the Spurs. Because I was like, oh, I remember telling some people, they're going to have to listen to Malone now. Malone's going to have their ear the whole week before that, prepping them. Interesting. And I kind of think that's a big that's a big deal for a team that won a championship for the first time, coming back, trying to repeat. Sometimes you get a little bored. You know, you just you get lackadaisical. I think this week Malone's going to have their ear because of that loss. And now that their path is just a little bit tougher, I think it woke them up a little bit. But here are my concerns about the Nuggets. They lost Jeff Green. They lost Bruce Brown. They lost Ish Smith. They lost leadership in that locker room. And I talked to somebody in the Nuggets recently who said, we're still kind of finding that way. We we lost some really valuable voices in the locker room. I think that is a key going into this, that we don't really know how it's going to play out in the in the, in the in their title run be, and the, to repeat because yes Jokic is is their leader so is Jamal Murray but they're not the most vocal guys and they would listen to Jeff Green and Ish Smith and all those guys they still have DeAndre Jordan number two their bench it's a it's unproven I mean we have Christian Brown yes he did 
He did shine last year at times. Reggie Jackson has shown that he can hit big shots. As well, Reggie Jackson the- is an inconsistent player. He right. has been for a decade. He right. will be always. But he did rise to the occasion when he when the Clippers went to the Western Conference Finals a few years ago. He, I have seen him rise to the occasion occasionally. <laughs> yes. uh, but, but I mean, it's it, this yes. is a concern. They're like not, the X factor, yeah. the X factor for me for them is Peyton Peyton Watson, who we saw like had six blocks a couple nights ago. I'm not saying he's going to do that every night. But they need someone to step up on the bench because Michael Malone leans so heavily on those starters. And yeah, they're healthy right now, but they need somebody to step up off the bench. I would say their margin for error is probably not as big as they want it to be. And I would also say that within the whole league, other than the Celtics series, whoever they play in the first round, and I, you know, whoever Denver plays in the first round. I think there should be no real favorites. I, I mean, um, I guess it will see who Oklahoma City draws. Uh, but like, I would not be like knocked over if any team, any of those East series, I would not be shocked if the lower seed won, other than the whoever Boston plays. In the West, obviously I would favor Denver, but I would I would not be stunned if the Lakers play the, 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 the Thunder and beat them. I would not be stunned if the Warriors pulled something out against Oklahoma City. It's not an insult to Oklahoma City. I would not be stunned. You know, we're going to talk about the Clippers and Mavericks here in a second. That's a completely, uh, you know, a whole a whole other story there. You know, I mean, Minnesota and Phoenix. Phoenix is red hot. They were 3-0 and against Minnesota this year, including winning Sunday to get out of the play-in. And for some reason, Ant Edwards isn't scoring against them. Now, again, I'm guilty. I'm going to ring the bell of my regular season bell, but I, I'm not sure why Ant doesn't play well against the Suns. I need to dig into well, it. Well, I think season. I think today he said that the Phoenix tends to not only double him, but they pack the paint. And so it just makes things a little more difficult. I mean, obviously, they're going to have to figure out. They have a whole week to figure out these double teams. But I think I'm also... Saying, I don't think there's going to be quote unquote, much upsets, which means that there's depth, which means that Denver, I think is going to have a tougher run and their margin for error is a little bit smaller. That's all I'm going to say. All right. That was a big game. Um, I would like to talk about the big game in the West on Sunday, which was the Lakers playing in New Orleans for a game that was going to determine whether the Lakers were going to be the 8-9 and whether the uh, the Pelicans were going to be the 6 or the 7. And um, I know Brandon Ingram is out. This game was on New Orleans floor. The Lakers just laid as close of an egg as you possibly can. They got out of the of Memphis with a win on Friday by the skin of their teeth. So you're telling me the Lakers didn't need an extra minute uh, in this game? That was a weird one. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> Bontemps, you wrote that story. Do you want to address McMenamin. that real quick? McMenamin, McMenamin did. Oh, McMenamin did. Oh, you tweeted the statement. Well, right. there was a... Yes. In the game on Friday, the shot clock reset to with about a minute and 15 seconds to go in the third quarter. Two minutes something, right? Well, there was the shot clock expired and the the buzzer didn't sound. So what happened was they hit recall. There's a recall button on the score monitor and it resets to the last time the buzzer went off. Well, nobody realized the buzzer didn't go off. So it goes back to two minutes and 20 seconds. And because that was the last time the shot clock went off. And somehow nobody in the arena noticed. I know it's crazy. Which is crazy because whenever you see something like that, usually somebody's like, hey, especially the in the okay, I would I would believe it in the second quarter. In the fourth quarter of a close game. Well, it was the third yeah. quarter. Third, third quarter. quarter. Oh, it was the third quarter. Yeah. There was okay. also, by was the way, fourth. recently, a couple weeks ago, Magic played the Kings in my in Orlando on March 23rd. In the third quarter of this game, the ball goes out of bounds with 8.15 to go in the third quarter. The ball is then inbounded, and for 50 seconds, the clock doesn't turn on. They go down and back and down and back again, and on the fourth time down, going back and forth, as Franz Bogner's about to shoot the ball, the clock finally starts. I've never seen anything like this. And nobody life. noticed? Nobody noticed. It was found later on Reddit. Wait for some sort of explanation from the league as to what happened there. But but by the way, all these protests, and I think there were a couple of them that happened this year, these protests will never, almost ever get upheld. This is the type of thing where 
if a team filed a protest, they potentially could win. They probably would win because but because in, the, in this case, <laughs> nobody the did. Actually, the Grizzlies actually, I think the Grizzlies were okay with losing. I don't think they cared, but yes, the Grizzlies actually picked up two points in that extra time. Yes. So well, the crazy thing is in that in that Sacramento game. In those untimed 50 seconds, Sacramento scored five points and won by two. Mm. So that obviously had an interesting impact potentially on the outcome of the game. And people like there was the game, the Knicks protested because of the missed call. You're never winning a protest on a missed call. But the one recent memory protest that worked was when Shaq got fouled out of a game when he had five fouls, which is right. an, which is a, a misapplication like of the rules. A misapplication of the rules is what causes games to get replayed, which is the, the which is obviously similar to I guess file that running. away. Wait, Kings wait, can, can Golden State protest that game? Because Sacramento finished there's ahead a of them and got, got home court in the play-in? There's a statute <laughs> of limitations on that stuff, and it's obviously way past it. But certainly but if I, Orlando I had been one win short, it would have been something to look back on. Well, the Kings, who fell to ninth the way things played out over the weekend, the Kings were fiery, spitting mad about Friday night. The Suns went in there and pulled out a win, a tight win, and obviously a game that was huge for the play-in standings. Mike Brown was furious about some calls down the fetch of that game, including Bradley Beal stripping De'Aaron Fox um, in a potential game-winning situation late. So the Kings fans, who are still not over 2002. Um, it, well, the modest opponents it, had a couple awful fouls late in that game, too. That was a brutal collapse by the Kings in that game. Up four it, with a minute 10 to go and losing is tough. Just keep in mind, as you, while where this season ends for the Kings, how you get so furious um, that 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 actually that little wrinkle did favor you. Okay, so in New Orleans on Sunday, this is a huge game for the Pelicans. Um, it's essentially a playoff game. Vitally important game on their home court. Brandon Ingram comes back off of this bruised knee. Who knows how healthy he was? Obviously didn't look good. Played 23 minutes, was minus 28. All you need to know is one stat from this game. It says it all. First half, Points in the paint. Lakers, 50. 25 baskets. Pelicans, 12. Basically, the Lakers came into this game and rammed it down their throat on their home court. And after the game, listening to Zion and Willie Green and reading the quotes, I was transported back to December when the Lakers played the Pelicans in a big game and rammed it down their throats. And after the game, it was all like, well, the Lakers were more aggressive. They wanted it more, blah, blah, blah. I know it's not necessarily apples to apples, but if you're the Lakers, you certainly thought it was apples to apples. They walked onto that court expecting to win. And now they got to play them again. They don't even have to travel. The Lakers have the best play in situation you could possibly dream of. They don't have to travel. They've owned this team when it's mattered. And even if they lose, they get to go home go play at home in a, a, you know, an elimination game. And the Pelicans let it happen with ridiculous mentality coming into this game. Yeah, I mean, look. He's as fired up as Bontemps about the Cavs. Well, well, well listen, well, he, we knew he was going to be that fired up about the Cavs. But <laughs> you, you go back to December, that was the biggest game to this point in Zion, Williams, Zion Williamson's career in that in-season tournament game. They obviously got obliterated in that game. You come back today, this is a huge game. Pelicans win this game. They get to 50 wins on the season. They guarantee themselves the sixth seed. They get into the playoffs without any shenanigans. And they get absolutely waxed on their home court. And now, they, as you said, the Lakers get to sit there for two days. And you think LeBron James is going to be nervous about going into New Orleans for a second time in three days to win another game? I don't think so. By the way, Zion had been playing great up to oh that Oh, my point. God. He had one of the best games of his career a couple of days ago. Yeah. yeah. Zion had been on, on a roll. Am I the only one that's going to say this on this pod that, I mean, I'm going to bring it up. Is it the worst thing in the world the Lakers lose this game in New Orleans? Here we I mean, because then they get, here, then they get to play for the eighth seed and they here get a much better matchup. And I kind of am here for the chaos when the if the Lakers play Oklahoma City or even Golden State. And that team, that veteran team, pulls out a game one against Oklahoma City, and now all of a sudden we're just like, Golden State's back. The Lakers I'm, are back. I'm, I'm here for that chaos. Mind. 
But I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, mind. it's not the worst thing in the world that the Lakers lose this Listen, six game. Alm is in L.A. right I'm now, and I guarantee mind. he's not the only guy in L.A. <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind. Please. I'm going to Laker lose my fans, mind. I know you're with me. I know you're with me. It's not the worst thing I would thing like in the world to ask is. LeBron James. I'd like to ask LeBron James. Hey, LeBron, I got a question. Are you afraid of Denver? You afraid of the Nuggets? I would love to ask LeBron James that question. Listen, I, I think it's way too much of a risk because let, let's just it's say it's an Lakers insane game, idea. They would it's they insane. potentially could face Golden State to get into the playoffs, which would be amazing in oh, itself. Okay. Oh, stop. It's an insane idea. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? I'm, I'm saying they're going the to odds, win the game. The they're going to give better. LeBron, they're going to give LeBron three extra days off, and they're going to try to beat Denver. Are they going to beat Denver? I certainly And they don't might get so. swept. They okay. might get swept. Is LeBron James trying to win a playoff series in year 21? Is that his goal? No, I, it's not. I'm saying if I'm a Laker fan, I feel better about their odds against Oklahoma City. Of all again, their odds of what? What are we doing and, here? They Their odds could be of, going could home on Friday. Round. This is insane. This is insane. It's the most insane. This is all right. This is the kind of stuff I was talking about earlier. It drives me absolutely insane. It's Listen, losing mentality. And I, I guarantee kinda, you, LeBron, if somebody said to LeBron me, James, hey, LeBron, let me just throw this out there. Nine, let me just throw this into the universe. Let me throw this into the universe. If somehow <sighs> the Lakers do get to eight and they play Oklahoma City, we could be looking at the LA LA matchup in the second round. That's all I got to say. Oh my God! We'll talk about that in a second. The Lakers were three and one in the oh, regular season. I am gonna. The universe is, centers is around actually, Los Angeles, Montemps. It sure does. For everybody who lives in Los Angeles, that's certainly true. My I'm gonna say nice. Zion Williamson had 13 points in the in-season tournament semifinal, and in this game on Sunday, he was four of 13 with 12 points. And Anthony Davis did whatever he wanted on the interior of that of that offense or interior of that paint. LeBron was whipping the ball around all over the place. They had a good shooting night. You know, when the Lakers have a good shooting night, everything looks good. But we'll say this. The Lakers finished the regular season winning 13 of their last 18. They, they went 13 and five down the stretch. I never saw the type of defense that I um, that I liked, that I saw last year that led me to, to think that they could do anything. I don't feel as optimistic about it because they don't have that defense. But 13 and five is not that small of a sample. And by the way, the Suns, I think went nine and four down the stretch. I believe the Warriors went nine and three, although they had a rough loss to the Pelicans um, uh, on, I think it was on Friday. Um, yeah, Friday night. So these teams are not, so I'm saying, I just don't think it's going to be upset. I don't think you can qualify most of these things as an upset. Um, but anyway, you mentioned the Clippers, Ulm. Um, the Clippers went through the motions against the Rockets. They already, um, had, were in position to get the four seed, the, uh, the Mavericks had let it go. Um, the Mavericks had had a huge turn of events with the Nuggets losing, going to the two seed and Kawhi has now been out two weeks. And as you said, the word from Ty Lu has basically been hopefully on Kawhi Leonard uh, by next weekend, by by uh, by next Sunday is when they would uh, open their series. Will open their series against the Mavericks. Um, where are we at with Kawhi? Where are we at with the Clippers in what could be an amazing playoff series? I think. Yeah, Lawrence Frank said the other day on the Clippers broadcast that he has inflammation in the knee. That same surgically repaired knee that he repaired ACL and MCL. And so they're trying to get the inflammation out. He has one week in that extra day because their, their game now is on Sunday to get right, to ramp back up. He has not played this month. The last time we saw him play was in Charlotte on March 31st, whatever the last day of March was. So by the time he plays in game one, if he is ready for game one, I think he will not have played in almost three weeks. Uh, that is a long time to be out, but... You you've seen we've seen Kawhi, Brian. We saw it last year in games one and two. We were like Apex Kawhi is back. Uh, it doesn't take much to get him back to that level. He um, was great in January, but he, you know. And that and listen, the, the Mavs know they've seen Kawhi at his best, obviously, in that game seven a couple years ago. As much as we talk about Luka Doncic and everybody thinks Luka Doncic owns the Clippers, huh. he is 0-2 in the playoffs against them. Yes, he, he, averages, he averages more points again. Outside 34. of Michael Jordan and, and Wilt Chamberlain, 
Uh, I think it's like 30, 34 points a game or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, Kawhi Leonard. You remember, though, you remember I, that? Did you with that viral moment? It was when I was on countdown that night. I don't remember how many Luca had against the Clippers that night, 40 something. And Kendra Perkins said, this is what much to my surprise pulled off his belt and started whapping the chair and said, this is what Luca does to the Clippers. <laughs> um, his regular season yeah. numbers are pretty good too. Yeah. I mean, he, he abs- absolutely, you know, just lights up when he faces them. I think he's averaging 33.5 points in his playoff career against the Clippers. But I looked this number up <clears throat> when he scores 40 or more, the Mavs are two and three against the Clippers. Um, we also tend to forget Kawhi Leonard gets overshadowed by Luka Doncic a little bit when they play each other because of those big numbers, but he's averaging Kawhi 32.4, 8.9 rebounds and 4.8 assists in his playoffs against Dallas in his, in his postseason career. So he certainly gets the job done. I wonder does Ty Lu not double Luka and maybe double Kyrie. Now they have, haven't faced those two together in a playoff series. And I would argue this is, this is definitely a more talented Mavs team offensively that they've had to, than they've ever faced in the playoffs, certainly with the trades that they made for PJ. Um, so I, I feel like this is going to be, this is tough. The Dallas is actually favored. I think uh, I saw already by Vegas or at least ESPN bet. So, but the thing is the stakes are higher in that series. Thanks to what happened last Friday, Ty Lue and Jason Kidd should send a bottle of wine to, to pop in San Antonio because now both teams probably have a legitimate reason to feel that the, the winner of this series, the disrespect for Oklahoma to the City Western is Conference amazing. Finals. And I'm, I'm talking about it as much as anybody, it's but it is, I, I think, is, I think both those teams like their that chances way. against a young be. Oklahoma city Thunder I'm sure, team. I'm we sure know what do. Oklahoma city has done. Shea's unbelievable. Okay. I know, but I guarantee you both of those teams, you know what? Whichever team wins that series is going to feel confident going into the second I think the Thunder are fine with it. The Thunder are how the number one seed and they get to be the underdog. It's, it's a wonderful incredible. situation. It's incredible. They're going to love it. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. Only you, us little puppies. I know they love it. They're yeah. thrilled about it. They can. It's us against the world. Nobody cares about us. We're fine. You know, there's no pressure on them as the one seed. It's unbelievable. And look, yes, the, of course the Clippers are the underdogs in this series because nobody knows who Kawhi is going to play. Everybody knew Kawhi was going to play. So it would be a toss-up. But right now, you, I, like, I'd still be a little surprised if Kawhi's, Kawhi's not Yeah, you'd be a little surprised. The point is nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So, yeah, I look, I think we all think Kawhi's going to play. We don't know Kawhi's going to play. So, if you don't know he's going to play, then the natural thing is to say, well, his team's probably not going to win. Now, assuming he does play, which let's it'd be much more enjoyable if he does, so I hope well, he does. Well, the thing about it is, let's just say he does play on Sunday. We don't know if he's going to play on Tuesday right. or Wednesday. Maybe he won't play thing. in game three. Right. Maybe that, he'll be gone. You know, just because he's back doesn't mean he's going to stay back. Right. Now, to your point before, Ohm, it is a very interesting series from a matchup perspective, right? Because you've got Luka and Kyrie in the backcourt for the Mavs, and you have to figure out, okay, how do you guard them? Are you putting your two best defenders on them? You're probably not putting Kawhi Leonard on one of those guys the whole game. I would assume Paul George is guarding one of them for a lot of the game. I'm assuming Terrence Mann is guarding the other one. I think you might see Terrence Mann on Luka. Uh, uh, unless Ty gets, you know, bold and does something like, you know, which he has done before, put he beats he had, I don't remember all the facts of it, but game one but I, against the Suns yeah. last year, he had some wild game plan that yeah, totally I, flummoxed I, the Suns. I can't remember. I think we'll see. Terrence Mann, Terrence Mann tends to get under Luka Doncic's skin. Luka Doncic talks trash nonstop to Terrence Mann. He does not like Terrence Mann. So I think maybe you'll see those two added a lot. PG, maybe, maybe PG starts on Kyrie, uh, get a little length on him. And then I think as a, you know, they're obviously going to give different looks, but I think maybe they say, we've seen Luca light us up. Maybe we can live with that, but we might not be able to live with Kyrie lighting us up. Yeah, that'll be interesting. And on the other side, the, the Mavs don't really have good options to guard PG and Kawhi. So it'll be interesting to see what they try to do with that. And ultimately, I think this series could come down to the health of James Harden and how does he play? Is that become somebody that Dallas can really attack? And do does he potentially end up getting sidelined for parts of this series because it's not going well? And the other thing is at the rim. Because as you know, Ohm, the, the Clippers have been at their best when Avika Zubac has been really good. He's been dealing yeah. with this calf injury. It's obviously a tricky thing. He now gets a, a bunch of time to get healthy. If he's healthy and playing well, they well, look like a different team. And when you, you look at Dallas with Gafford, and maybe Derek Lively, if he's back, obviously terrible tragedy about his mother. 
Um, that that was awful news over the weekend. But um, if if those two guys are playing 48 minutes at center as lob threats for Luca and for Kyrie and giving them rebounding and a rim presence at the in the paint, that only increases the importance of Zubac to give them good minutes. Right, so we'll that, see what he can that do. helps keep Zoo on the floor. But if if Dallas goes small, Tyloo likes to go small. And perhaps Dallas sees, will see this, that when the Clippers do go small, they cannot rebound. They have trouble defending and they have trouble rebounding when they're small. And so maybe Jason Kidd goes small at some point late in games there and, and takes him in. But you're right about James Harden. James has not really been the same now for a while. He's been dealing with inflammation in his right foot. That's bothered him for about over the past week or more. Earlier this season, maybe about a couple of weeks, maybe about a month ago, he had a strain like in his left shoulder. So those are things that have kind of bothered him. And, and when they were going good, when they were 26 and five, James was playing his best playmaking, finding Evita Zubats inside on that pick and roll, getting easier shots for Kawhi and Paul, not necessarily scoring a ton, but he also did hit shots from the outside, keeping defenses honest. A lot of times this season, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it, I've often thought, why is James passing up so many shots? He tends to pass up almost wide open catch and shoots because it's just he's just not used to it over the last decade. And sometimes he just defers too much. I think there's going to be a couple games here or there this season. They're going to need James Harden to hit yeah, a lot of I think shots. I think that's got a chance to be a super fascinating series. We'll talk about more about that later. We'll definitely talk more about the Suns Wolves later in this week. Before we go, we've got to really address this very tasty matchup that played out. The Lakers squiggle, squiggly, wiggly, move their way up to eighth. And the Kings with that, you know, really rough loss on Friday, the Suns fall back to ninth, setting up the NorCal rivalry that's been developing big time over the last year. Kings Warriors and the other play in the late game on Tuesday night. Um, the last three times these teams played, it was a one game, a one point game. Came down to one point. Uh, the Kings won two of them. The Warriors won one of them. The Kings have won the last two. I think De'Aaron Fox might have missed some of those games. I look it up. Um, they did split the season series. Uh, the Warriors won the other game. Um, we all remember last year that incredible series that won seven games. Draymond stomping in on Demonis Sabonis, um, going on his podcast, getting suspended. Uh, Sabonis going for x-rays. <laughs> um, look, it's going to be it's going to be intense. There's a lot on the line. The Kings have really not performed that much different from last year, but last year they had like no injuries. This year they've had some injuries and though that's the difference between and the between, West is a lot better. Yeah, between being the 3 seed and the 9 when the West is down versus the West being strong and health versus injuries. And um, look, the Warriors are fighting for their life here, and their matchup with the Thunder isn't the worst in the world. So they had, you know, I think they believe that they can. They just won in LA like a week or so ago, week or week and a half ago, and they had that really weird ending where they kept kept having replay after replay after replay. So this is a high stakes game. Starts at ten o'clock Eastern. Uh, you're going to want to stay up for this. This is the play in tournament at its finest. It could go any which way. Honestly, it could go any which way. And I, you know, the game, the, the cameras will be on every step that Draymond and Sabonis take with each other. Yeah. I mean, look, that's going to be a heck of a battle. You've got Steph Curry and Darren Fox. You've got the Warriors trying to get the last gasp, maybe out of this team could be the last game. Clay Thompson plays as a warrior. Um, I don't believe that, but it's I'm true. not saying it will be, but he's going to be a free agent. We'll see what happens there. So yeah, there's a ton of drama, ton of stakes. Obviously this has become one of the more fun rivalries in the league. And the winner of this game could be facing the Lakers uh, or the Pelicans will be facing the Lakers or the Pelicans. And with all the history between the Lakers and the Kings and the Lakers and the Warriors, if they do end up losing to the Pelicans. So I, I certainly think they're going to win. Again, you're looking at an eight-nine game Friday to make the playoffs with a heck of a lot on the line, also with a ton of history at stake too. So, the West playing has been fun the last couple of years, and this should be no different again over the next few days. Look, Warriors ten and two down the stretch. It kind of feels like they got their mojo back. Uh, you know that entire arena is going to be all over Draymond. I hope Draymond keeps his cool. Uh, I'm looking. It forward won't be to the whole arena, <laughs> but. 
Uh, there will be some Warriors be, fans there. Yeah, yeah. There'll be some I like the Warriors. Great, it's, it, the, the, I like the, the Warriors the, to win the game. It's it's a great venue. It's a great Incredible. venue for a playoff Incredible place. Um, and you know that the Warriors will 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 feed on it. You know that they're not afraid of it. Um, so yeah, I like I like the Warriors to win the game, but it's going to be fun and it'll be a great atmosphere, and I'm excited to watch it. Yeah. Okay. So playoffs are here. Here we go. Play in tournament first up. We've got a lot going on. We'll be talking to you all the way through it. Thanks for watching, listening to the Hoop Collective. Thank you to Jackson and Andrea, our producers. Thank you to Ulm and thank you to Bontemps. And we'll talk to you later this week.